Hey, villagers. Hey, Hi. what's up? Aloha. Oh, good Hello, day to my you. friend. I was over by the stone pile getting some stones, you know, because we're in the Stone Age. Of course, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, Neolithic means new Stone Age. We're truly the next generation. We really live in a futuristic time. This technology will never become outdated. Stones are awesome. I love them so much. Yeah, anyway, I saw some really big stones. They were enormous. Were they megaliths? <laughs> Get it? Because that means big stones. Yeah, we got it. Uh -huh. You know what's that funny? So anyway, we've been farming so much, everything is very routine now. I work so hard on the farm, I could just die sometimes. I could just spontaneously die. Me too. I wish there was some kind of spiritual connection we could have. Some kind of large physical object we could worship at. It's a shame our beliefs aren't well documented. Too bad we're still in prehistory. Nah, people will think we're mysterious. That's cool. Look at me. I'm mysterious. What if we use some megaliths to make a structure to store all of our dead people? What? Dead people? Yeah, there aren't any dead people here. Bro, I'm totally dead. They're oh, dead? Whoa, wow. I they really Rumba. just spontaneously died. I think it's time we enter the megalithic part of the Neolithic age. For sure, yeah. it's about time. Yeah, yeah let's is do the that. Time. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Oshukapografia. That word is too big, you can call it OXG for short. This is a series where we'll be using city skylines to create a historic city, which will be based loosely around the historic timeline of Lisbon, Portugal, home of Shuka the Cat. Meow. This is still a very new series, so you've made it just in time to really become involved in this epic project. Our timeline is just now advancing through the Neolithic era, and the agricultural revolution has laid the foundations here for permanent human settlement. I've received a lot of great comments about how to proceed from the last episode, so we'll try to take them all into consideration. Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell so you get notified for when I'll be going live for finishing the other villages after completing this first Neolithic village today. So in the last episode, the agricultural revolution took place. By using custom assets converted into simple procedural objects, this first of eight original hunter-gatherer tribes has settled a village at the foot of this large hill near the river. We've begun planting crops and raising sheep, and the key term for this type of lifestyle is agro-pastoralism. This just means that the people farm crops and raise animals in open land. This is still a relatively small population, and there are no clearly defined roles or social hierarchies. Everyone works cooperatively to manage this sustenance lifestyle in relative peace. If that sounds pretty utopian to you, just remember that there were very few humans on Earth compared to today. The estimated global human population remained approximately 3 to 5 million people for 99.99% of prehistory, a period of about 3 million years. The agricultural revolution changed that. More bread means more making babies, and more babies are needed to make more bread. So let's add another farm field so we can get some more population. We'll keep it in this area by the fertile soil near the river. Let me demonstrate a simple procedural objects technique that I briefly mentioned last episode, which is moving vertices. A decal like this big farm field has eight vertices. It's not a single sheet, but more like a flat box. It behaves a little differently than some other procedural objects, but by going to advanced customization, we can right click and drag to grab these corner vertices and move them within the original footprint of the decal. This will allow the road to be visible instead of covered up by the field. Holding control while moving vertices will disable the snap to axis feature, which you may want to do. We'll mix normal decals with PO decals to get the look we want on this not perfectly flat terrain. And we'll plant some crops and shrubs around the field, giving the impression this is a slightly different species of wheat than our other field. Like barley, perhaps. Pressing F10 gives us access to our Dynamic Resolution Mods UI, 
which we'll use to quickly upscale the resolution and see our field in ultra high def. Let's add two more huts down here to increase our population just a little bit more. Remember that for now, we're just making prop villages that will be integrated into regular game mechanics later on. Now this I probably could have done last episode. I didn't mention that fishing was still an important part of the lifestyle here, so we'll create a little fishing dock using a McCluck's fishing wooden dock prop. It may be a bit anachronistic to have a dock like this at this time, I'm not totally sure, but it's a simple representation of fishing for us, so we'll use it. The water here does go up and down a tiny bit, not specifically intentionally, but just because of the shape of the river, so we can check to make sure our dock will always be above water. And converting into procedural objects, we can extend the deck into the soil and the pilings into the riverbed. Again, I'm not sure what Neolithic dock technology was like, or if it even existed, but this doesn't have to be totally accurate. It's just a representation of fishing, so we know. While I'm working on the waterfront, let's use Ronix 69's riverbed decals to give some textured look underwater. Now next to the dock, we can add three pergolas. Again, more as a representation of structures, but also because they kind of look like drying racks from the game Dawn of Man. People can hang fish and meats up here to be salted and dried in the sun. Let's start thinking about our first ore industry. It's not metal ore, it's just stone. You know, because uh, it's the Stone Age. So we'll just kind of come over here by this cliff and figure that it is an easy spot to grab some rocks. We're not digging quarries yet or anything like that, we're just picking up stones that we find on the ground. Using Find It, we'll look for some vanilla concrete debris piles that we could use. Yep, there's, uh, there's nothing here. That's because whoever named these assets over a colossal order wrote Concrete Debris. So you have to search for that in order to find it. We'll place these down to look like it's just a rocky area near this little cliff, and we can add some larger rocks as well. Let's place some decals around and then recolor the rock piles to match our cliff texture color. Okay, now it's time to think about megaliths. Megalith does in fact mean big stone, but the vanilla megaliths are really quite large. We've got menhurs, or single vertical stones, and triliths, which are two vertical and one horizontal stone together. They are terrain conforming props, which means they kind of change shape depending on the terrain under them. If we pull out our trusty meter stick prop, we see that these are between 5 and 9 meters tall, or about 16 to 30 feet tall. That's really big. 
The megaliths in Stonehenge are about 4 meters tall, for some reference. So to imagine a megalith twice the size of that is pretty hard to believe. But the largest single stone megalith of the Neolithic Age was the now broken Menhir of Ergara in Brittany, France, which stood 20.6 meters tall. Now when I use Move It's Shrink and Grow feature, something strange happens. Shrinking seems okay, as it makes the stone very skinny and a bit smaller, but using the increased size, it gets fatter but starts also getting shorter. So that's a bit counterintuitive, but that's just what happens. All right, let's scout out our megalithic sites. We'll go look just outside of the village and over here, we see a somewhat isolated mound. I think this will be a good burial mound. We can follow the terrain back from the village to make a natural road to this site. Before we begin constructing our mound, let's go over using block services. They function just as regular in-game buildings, but can be hidden inside of objects. But they're still buildings, and if you try to bury it underground with Move It, it will take some of the terrain with it. So since we don't want the mound to go down, we'll leave it just a tiny bit buried for now. Let's add a trilith entry portal to our burial mound here, and maybe squeeze in a small menhir as well. I don't know if that'll be necessary, but we'll give it a try. Instead of creating some kind of procedural object or ploppable surface to extend the ground over the trilith, we can just use this large filler grass by P. Delmo. It's pretty flat on the bottom, so it should give the illusion of being soil underneath, and we can use it to cover up our cemetery block as well. I'll also use some of the filler bush assets near the portal to better cover up the walls. My challenge here will be not making this too overgrown. This should be a mostly accessible mount. A burial mound is also known as a barrow or a tumulus. In Portuguese, they are known as mamoas, which comes from the Latin word mamula because the Romans thought they looked quite mammary. On top of this mamua, we will put a dolmen, which is a single chambered tomb, which is usually three or more vertical megaliths with a flat megalith roof. To create the roof, I've decided to use a ploppable asphalt surface instead of a procedural object. Normally I'd use PO, but I'm trying to see if it's better with a ploppable surface. I may end up scrapping ploppable surfaces altogether if none of my assets are dependent on them, but I'm not quite ready to do that just yet.
This structure we've just made is based on the Great Dolmen of Comenda da Igreja, which is found in the Alentejo region, a short drive out of Lisbon. There are dozens of dolmens and burial mounds and hundreds of menhirs found around Portugal, thousands more around the rest of Europe and all over the world. Many of them sit in empty fields, only ever visited by locals or perhaps the passing archaeologists. Now that this burial site is complete, let's add a cromlech circle nearby. In English, cromlech is a term for both a burial site, like we just made, as well as large stone circles such as the great cromlech of Almendres, also found in the Alentejo region of Portugal. The use of sites like these is one of the great ongoing debates in prehistoric archaeology. Some were likely used for calendar purposes with the sun, but otherwise it's still generally unclear. We'll just make a circular pattern of menhirs here, with two in the middle for good luck. We don't want them to be too tall, it just seems way out of scale for this project. Now I'm going to use a vanilla sandbox prop as a fire pit and add a fire camp marker to light it up. Probably should have done this even as far back as the first episode in the Paleolithic era, but I didn't want to get too crazy, so now we'll add a few around the map and make up for it. You know what? Let's add a few more roundhouses to our village while we're at it. Let's also change out the smoke from the kiln because it kind of looks like the bread is burning. Okay, now I'm going to detail in some trees, vegetation, decals, and props off camera and do a camera fade so smooth that if you aren't looking closely, you might not even realize that it just took place. Damn, that was super smooth. Alright, let's just do a review look at our first complete Neolithic village. A few weeks ago, I went on a field trip to the Alentejo region and the historic city of Evora and I studied the landscape there as much as I studied everything else. I think it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that adding trees and vegetation to a map really make it come to life more than anything else that you can do. I use them extensively in my 100% vanilla baby city to create the most photorealistic look possible, and here, with a custom theme and a nice selection of flora, the map really looks very authentic. I carefully tried to recreate the appearance of the uncultivated areas of Alentejo land I saw around on my trip. I think this is a pretty good representation. Despite being a small country, Portugal has several dramatically different biomes, and I'm trying to be accurate in my representation of them.
So we've finished our first village. Doesn't yet have a name because we don't know enough about the language these early Iberian people spoke. So for now, we'll still leave it as Tribe 1. The remaining seven villages will utilize basically the same ingredients we have here. Huts, wells, agro-pastoralism, fishing, stone collection sites, and megalithic monuments. But because each of these other villages are in a unique location, the way in which we design these villages will depend largely on the geography. Let's fly around the map and refresh our memories on what they look like so we can imagine their future. I've never done a live stream before, so I've been learning how to do it effectively so that the next OXG can be a completely interactive experience where we create the remaining Neolithic villages together. Maybe we'll even name some tribal chieftains for some of you who show up. So I hope to see you there. Again, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe and bell button to get notifications for this upcoming event. Also, if this channel ever attracts 500 subscribers, we'll unlock the ability to do community posts on YouTube, which will allow me to create quick polls that will enable all of you to regularly vote on the direction this historic city develops. So, if you're so inclined, feel free to spread the word. I don't usually like to ask for such things, but I think we can all agree that this city will evolve much better with the polling feature. Quick note for any new people who are watching this, if you subscribe and comment, you will earn a special building in the 100% Vanilla Baby series, like over 300 of you already have. Thank you so much for the support. I hope you all enjoy this project, and I'll see you next time.